very much in line with, with keeping the one thing necessary, the one thing necessary that is God's word, is listening to the one thing necessary, and that is the first lesson, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. This is the word of our Lord. The second lesson kind of falls in the line of pattern of thought. First, we know the one thing needful, God's word. We listen to the one thing needful, that is God's word. Then we put that into practice, as Paul reminds us in Colossians chapter 3, with a number of ways that we can put God's words into practice. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance if any, any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you, will, you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of our Lord. The Holy Gospel is recorded for us in Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 38. While they were traveling, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, and she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So tell her to give me a hand. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice, and it will not be taken away from her. This is the gospel of the Lord. God's grace and mercy and peace are yours through his Son and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning is that text from Luke's gospel, chapter 10, verses 28 through 32. Again, a very familiar account from God's word, but it's one of those things that as parents need to tell their children something over and over and over again because it's we have a tendency to forget things or to not follow those things. This, this is one of those portions of God's word that we, we know it, <clears throat> we've heard it a thousand times, but we fail to put it into practice. We, we miss out on the blessings then when we fail to put that into practice, the, this account of Jesus telling us the one thing that is necessary, the one thing that is, is needful. Dear brothers and dear sisters in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. So what did Martha do wrong really here? It doesn't seem like she was really doing anything wrong, does it? Martha had invited Jesus into her home. This was one of Jesus' closest family friends on this earth. 
a family of, of three siblings, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Lazarus is not included in this account, but Mary and Martha figure prominently. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem from the northern part of Israel. He's passing through Bethany. This is where they lived, and he thought, you know, this is, I want, I want to say hello. Maybe have something to eat. Just like anybody would if you had a relative or a good friend from high school and you're going from point A to point B and your friend from high school, a really good friend, maybe stood up in your wedding, was between. You you call ahead and you say, do you mind if we stop by? And they say, not only are you going to stop by and stay the night, but you're going to have supper here as well. This is the situation that Jesus found himself on this particular day. And and when he got there, everything started out just fine. Mary went about getting ready for Jesus' visit and the supper. Mary sat and listened to Jesus, caught up with Jesus, listened to what Jesus, whatever words that came out of his mouth. And everything seemed to be going well. Martha was going to give Jesus a dinner. Not only was she going to give him the best dinner that she could afford and the best dinner that she could cook and offer, but she was going to have the best table. It was going to be set perfectly. The house was going to be spotless. Jesus, yes, was a good friend of Mary and Martha, but on this particular day, Jesus was also an honored guest. And so Martha was going to make sure that Jesus knew that he was an honored guest. But then the atmosphere started to change a little bit. You could cut the air, the tension with the knife there. In most of the pictures that you see that were, have ever been written or drawn or, or sketched on this account of, of Luke chapter 10, you always see Mary kind of in the background and she's hunched over and she's either cooking at the fire or she's doing some cleaning. And then you see Mary again figuring more prominently and she is simply sitting there and she's listening to Jesus. And Martha sees it and Martha feels it. And by the time that everything boils over in Martha and she just can't keep silent anymore, she's not just frustrated with her sister Mary, but she's also frustrated with Jesus. You can see that in her question. Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve all alone? Jesus was at fault now. It wasn't just Mary that was at fault, but Martha was blaming Jesus because he wasn't doing what he should have been doing and saying to Mary, you know something, your sister is working awfully hard behind the scenes here. Why don't you go and help her? So so Martha feels that now she has the onus put on her that she's supposed to correct the situation, doing something that Jesus should have been doing himself. And yet, when all is said and done, it's Martha that gets the bad rap here. Martha goes down in biblical history as busy Martha. She's almost got that that uh, nickname, kind of like Thomas. You don't know just Thomas as one of Jesus' disciples. You know Doubting Thomas as one of Jesus' disciples. You don't know Peter as one of Jesus' disciples. You know the one that always spoke or acted before he thought. Or the one that denied Jesus. Now, now we've got busy Martha to add to everything. This little five-verse account, just five verses in God's Word, does a wonderful job of teaching Christians a little bit about the one thing that is necessary, the one thing that is needful. And it starts with service, or the lack of service. Has anybody ever heard of the 80-20 rule? Anybody that's in business or anybody that has any kind of organization experience knows this. I don't know that there's any science behind it, but it's always said that if you are a part of an organization, 20% of the people in that organization will do 80% of the planning and the organizing and the work and the serving and the carrying out of whatever that organization is doing. And I think the same thing could probably hold true in many churches. 20% of the people do 80% of the work, which leads to nothing but bad things on the part of the people that are serving, right? Resentment. Why am I the only one that always volunteers? Why am I the only one that that is willing to serve on the council? Why am I the only one that that has joined the ladies' aid in the last five years? There's a whole lot of people that are a whole lot younger than I. 
I think it's time for me to retire. If everybody gave the same percentage of income as I give, this church would never have any financial problems. How come they don't ask other people to serve in those capacities? Now, now there might be some truth to those things, <clears throat> that it is a small group, very often that does a large portion of the work in any organization, but isn't that attitude the exact opposite of the attitude that Jesus wants from his children? Does Jesus want us to serve with resentment? Does Jesus want us to reserve with a, with a, but, I'll do it, but I don't want to do it. And I guess I'll do it because everybody else has passed on this particular volunteer opportunity. Jesus embodied the right kind of service attitude. Philippians chapter 2 is quoted so many times in the course of a church here, Palm Sunday especially. What did Jesus do? He took the form of a servant and he humbled himself and he lowered himself from heaven itself to the sin-filled earth that he had created perfectly at once upon a time. And he did that, why? So that he might serve us. The only way that he could serve us in order to bring us eternal life. That's Jesus' model for us. That's how Jesus wants us to serve as well. If I'm grumbling about the fact that there are so few people serving besides me, is it because I know that there are so many people out there that are missing out on the joy and the peace and the happiness that I get when I serve? Is that the reason that I'm grumbling? No, it's probably I'm grumbling because I drew the short stick or I don't see anybody else doing it, or therefore, I guess I have to do it. Which only leads to, again, bad things. People will burn out. People will quit. People will do the job, but they'll do it with a terrible, terrible attitude in their minds. Or it'll turn a person who, who, who at one time loved to serve in any way into a very bitter person and a resentful person and a person who is always thinking about how can I get out of what I am doing now. But what the worst thing is about that whole situation is that we are turning the joy of service. And, and really, serving the Lord is a joy if you really looked at it from the proper perspective. It's something that is so fulfilling and makes you so full of happiness, and it turns that kind of happiness and joy into a sin. I really don't want to do God's work, but I guess I'm stuck doing God's work because nobody else is going to do God's work. Listen to how Jesus handles the situation. I, I love how whenever you think, well, this is what I would say in this situation, or this person deserves this from me. He deserves a lecture, just like I would give my, my child. Listen how Jesus handles the situation. Instead of snapping at Martha the way that Martha snapped at Jesus, he gently instructs her by saying, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needful. And Mary knows what it is. She's chosen the one thing that is necessary. There were so many things that distracted Martha from what she was doing. The, the, the Greek word simply means that she was divided. The word that is translated distracted really means divided. So she was literally divided in different ways, all kinds of different ways. Why? Because she was doing this and she was doing that and she knew that she had to do this and this was sitting undone and she didn't want to have all those things happening to her. But the one thing that was needful was being drowned out by all the things that were unnecessary. Martha was missing out on the one thing that mattered. And if you look at the front of your bulletin cover, as somebody said on Thursday night, it's not the coffee that is the one thing needful. It's the words that are sitting next to that coffee. Jesus' words are, is what, are what is necessary in our lives because Jesus' words give us forgiveness and Jesus' words give us peace and Jesus' words give us hope and Jesus' words give us what we need for every single day of this life. Mary found what was necessary. Martha was still looking for him. And what Martha needed more than anything else at this time, she needed to be served and she needed to be served by Jesus himself. 
the whole point of, of this little account is not that God does not want us to work for him or that God does not want us to volunteer or that God does not want us to serve. He simply wants us to come to church and, and just sit in the pews. And, and that's what we should be focusing on. And, and, and everything else can kind of take a second place. The point is that first, he wants you to listen. First, he wants us to open up his word. First, he wants us to hear what he says and put into practice what he says. And when you do that, your heart will be changed and then you will be moved to do the service part. That's always the right order. It's not we do good works in order to get God in God's, God's good graces. We do good works because Jesus has given us God's grace. Jesus has been God's grace in our lives. We are justified first, declared not guilty, and then we are sanctified to do good works. And the same thing happens in our daily lives as Christians. First we hear God's word. And then that word, if you're listening to it, that's going to motivate you to do things for the Lord. You know what the most important activity for any child of God is? And it seems counterproductive. Just sit there. Just sit there and do nothing. Just listen. Open up your Bible and read the words on the page. Start the practice of a Bible study, whether it's at home or at church. When the meditations come out next week, grab the meditations so that there's none left over after the first or second week that they're out there. Make it a daily habit, a daily regular practice to spend some time in God's word. Focus on the cross. Focus on Jesus' death. Focus on Jesus' resurrection. Focus on the blood that Jesus spent for us to be cleansed. And then you are going to be more appreciative and you'll be moved more to do the service that God wants us to do. Again, the main point, keep the main thing, listening to Jesus' words. Jesus is your servant. Jesus did not come to be served. He came to be your servant. And he showed that on the cross ultimately. Why? Why would he do that? Because that's just what Jesus does. We might not be that same category to the extent that Jesus is, but that's what God does. He loves and he serves and he shows his love in his service for us. The one thing that we really needed, the bottom line is Jesus serving us on the cross. He, he knew how little we would appreciate it. He knew that we would take it for granted he knew that we would go weeks without thinking of his cross. He, would, he knew that we would not be appreciating it the way that we should, but he did not complain. Father, they're not appreciating what I'm doing. Tell them to appreciate me more like Martha did. They don't know what I have done for them. He simply encourages gently, listen. Listen to my words. And in his words, he gives us life. Why did Jesus come to Mary and Martha's house that day? Because he wanted to give them something good. He wanted to give them actually something better than what they were accustomed to getting. The one thing that was the best thing was the one thing needful. His word, which gives us life eternal. Amen. The peace of God which goes beyond our understanding will guard and keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.